Uh, thank you very much, Thoreen. And uh, also, thank you, Kathy. Um, I love our Friday afternoons uh, downtown. Um, oh, oh, sorry. And Annette, thank you so much for inviting me. This is very exciting. Uh, this is our first, and we also hope that it's uh, definitely not our last. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, the cohort. You know who we are, you are. Um, thank you for accepting us unconditionally. It's been wonderful. And uh, I also want to thank my partner. Uh, because there's two other mammals that I need to recognize her, who I would be woefully incomplete without, and this guy. <laughs> now, um, rest easy, this is not Sean's dog show or something like that. Um, <laughs> because it could uh, for several hours. But anyway, the reason why I wanted to bring him into the picture, this is Teton, by the way, uh, is I uh, want to share a story with you of how wonderful and awesome you all are. So uh, I'm walking the boy a couple weeks ago. And uh, I was also thinking about a segue into the talk, and um, so I'm just, just chilling, walking for a while. And uh, we just pass a house, and this lady out front just starts walking towards us, and we're like, all right, what's going on? And uh, so the lady comes over, and, and I swear this is exactly what she said. I was, well, I suppose this is going to be my daily uh, random act of kindness. Hands me this flower. So I'm standing with a flower, a leash, and a dog within me going, uh, this doesn't happen on the East Coast very often. So we're kind of freaked out. <laughs> Um, but it is. It's, um, this is a really wonderful place. We've only been here a year and a half, and you can start seeing immediately this sense of connection and, and community. And um, it, it just, it, it's so embracing. And so what I want to do is uh, identify another uh, example of this, and that's our lovely farmer's market. Uh, our first one blew us away. Uh, and it's not just, you know, we have like four or five little stands or something like that. This thing goes on forever. We've only been here a year and a half, and it already takes us two hours to get past because we're meeting everybody, and hey, what's going on? I got the strawberries, and like it just gets a little bit intense sometimes, but it's been wonderful. <laughs> um, um, and you know it's true. But from an economic point of view, I'm sure that the, one of the original catalysts for something like this was for economic activity, letting vendors come in, the surrounding farmers, get an outlet. But you're not telling me this is a grocery store. They just walk up, give it five bucks for your filberts, which we found out. Um, and that's it. It's, it's the least of your things. It's, it's talking to somebody. It's uh, being educated, uh, connecting. Um, I, I try to reconcile this, okay, is it just an economic thing or is it something more? And if it is something more, which it is and we all know it, how do you measure that? And how do you start valuing that? And how do you make sure that more of these things just happen naturally? From a state government's perspective, which I have most of my, uh, my life is in, um, and it's part of this talk, is that's really tough for us in government, is to identify those, measure those, and the easy ones are the economy, but what about those senses of place and connection and all those things that don't necessarily have an actual number? Um, those are much harder to include. And so I want to give you tonight some insight on how, how we can start moving, how, what are those new measurements that are coming out, being more sophisticated, but also can uh, provide policy makers and policy analysts and budget analysts to make the right decisions and to, and to turn that into something that is we envision. And most importantly, to turn those into what I would call commonplace. Just by setting up these situations, setting up these you know, rules or whatever it is, these conditions, that things come out just naturally. So that's the insight, that's what my story is. I want to kind of give you an insight on what, why we're not maybe sometimes doing the right thing how we're moving towards that. So um, these are some of the, this is an approach that I was starting in Maryland, uh, working here in Oregon. Um, and it's, uh, the process isn't that, you know, earth shattering, um, but how we're kind of doing it is. So uh, real quick, you can see behind me, uh, the five steps are, you need a vision and a plan, uh, need a measure, how are we gonna measure these things, how are we going to value those things, how are we gonna link them, and then how are we gonna use them. Now, there's a little bit of foreshadowing. One and two are usually in the community a little bit easier. We get a vision and a framework and a plan, and then we can measure the things and love the dorm thing with the energy. Like those kind of, those are coming online more and more. We're using data on a data basis. It's the other three, three, four, and five that sometimes we might stumble over. So what I'm gonna do is walk you through these five and try to highlight how we can use more of a systems approach to make the outcomes natural. So first, uh, here in Corvallis, we have our vision plan, uh, vision statement, sorry, and the framework. By the way, uh, awesome. Um, these are really well done, and very distinct, so of those five, um, check. 
Um, these are the 12, as you are all keenly aware. Um, I really like how it's framed and looking at how the 12 really critical components, the uh, areas that matter most, all kind of come together. So that's number one. So we have our vision, our blueprint. Number two, how do we measure? Well, on the left you can see over here, I just, and by the way, just randomly selected waste management. We can see how we're measuring on the left. This is our uh, trade partners that uh, were the state uh, Oregon Explorer. This is waste management. We have a waste uh, landfill from 2009. Uh, we can have that information. Uh, on the right is straight from the framework. And so, and again, this is wonderful. Uh, very few frameworks in my experience have baseline data like you have. So again, we have <laughs> one to two, sorry. Uh, <laughs> video are coming up. So um, again, looking at those top five, blueprint and the measurements, got a pretty good handle on it. Now let's get to some of the different measurements, and that is how do we value. So um, we talked about education in our table, and I'm assuming you do have as well. Um, one of the things that I kind of, uh, that we're looking at are what are the value of these components of the society. So let's take education. Now I'm going to say value of an education. I'm not talking cost of tuition. Those are three different things. Price, cost, and vi uh, value are all completely different things. Unfortunately, too often we combine them into one. We need to start parsing that out and recognize, okay, what's going on? So what's the value of an education? Well, I'm sure we could sit here and talk about other things, but academically, uh, one is graduates volunteer more. Two, uh, they vote more. And I don't mean like the same election, like Chicago vote early at all. <laughs> I wrote that out this morning, I'm like, uh, probably should have used a different word there. Um, stronger community engagement, higher philanthropy. This kind of surprised me. You take a graduate millionaire and a non-graduate millionaire, the graduate millionaire will give more money away. These are those non-market, I call them non-market things that contribute to a true value of a, of a college graduation um, diploma. So when you add those up, academically, this is a $2,011, it's about $19,000 per student that we don't, or graduate, that we don't normally include on our massive ledger. We should start thinking about that when we do cost-benefit analysis, when we do these kinds of things as a government, as a policy making that aren't currently there. Okay, that's human capital. Let's go to our natural resources, natural capital. Um, I know in the back you may not be able to see this, but it's always this kind of weird thing. If I don't put them up there, then everybody asks me, what's an ecosystem service? And then I put it up there. I can't see what an ecosystem service is. So um, these are, sorry, that's true. Uh, these are the different ecosystem services that farmland, forests, and wetlands provide. And as you can see for yourself, there's a lot of things. Now, uh, I assume all the humans in here are carbon-based and mammals. And so we need this kind of weird thing called oxygen. And so there's, I'm hoping there's no one in here that thinks a tree, the only reason we have a tree is for two by fours and for paper. They provide so much more, but it's hard to get those other things on the ledger to recognize that. Things like uh, oxygen, uh, carbon sequestration, uh, cleaning our waters, providing lower temperatures on streams for salmon. All those things rarely get on the books. And so when you start adding those things, these are some of the average estimates for the Northwest. Uh, you see that 24, we've well, we got 28,000 uh, for wetlands. Um, that's, that's pretty low, mid-range you could say, because uh, at least on the East Coast, uh, an average acre for wastewater treatment plants that wetlands do for free costs between 25 and 30,000 an acre. So this is when we start looking at when we start looking at either development or sprawl or these kind of things. They all will talk about, oh, we need to save trees or we need to look at wetlands and these things. But these have real economic impacts, especially for local governments with coffers decreasing and uh, fiscal impacts really hitting. So these are some of the ways we can measure our natural capital. How do we measure health? Highly recommend you checking out uh, Gallup Healthways. Uh, they do a, it's Gallup, so you, know, you get the call. Uh, who are you going to vote for? Or what are you going to do? Uh, they do the same thing with health. And so these are the six categories that they ask you about. And they're very, very, very specific questions. It's not how do you feel. It's did you go out with a coworker in the last week? Like, what well, does that matter? Well, are you safe in your community to go out with your coworker? Do you feel uh, in partnership? Do you feel safe with your, with your coworkers? It starts, again, this is all academically based. You start getting these indexes, and then they rate them out. And the reason why I like this so much, they've been around for about five, six years. Um, 
They do it federally, every state, and every congressional district. We can nail all the way down to here to see uh, of those six categories how we're doing. So we can add that into livability index, however you want to call it, and start looking at all these different components. I don't have much time, because it's an estimate for a lot. But um, I would like to say that this is literally the ice cube sitting on the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but I did want to give you a flavor of all the different ways that we can value non-market goods and services. So, we have our blueprint, our vision. We have how we measure traditionally, how we uh, look at non-market or alternatives. Now let's look at how we link them. Now this gets a little bit wonky, but it's critically important and hit our table and hit yours. But how we can start linking different policies to maximize our output. So here are, about, here are your 12, and to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, let's look at the farmer's market. Again, it's not just the money, which I think is here. You have community inclusion. I learned so much. It's great, especially in the middle where you have like a health thing, you get your blood pressure, all kinds of stuff, and then talk about it. Um, food, uh, kind of a duh. Uh, land use, local resource based industries, whether that's uh, the orchards, filberts, or your food, all of these things connect.